Well, today we have Tim Hoffman with us. Um, we've been going through a series of videos covering the Passover, and Tim comes from a, a, uh, a bit of a different um, understanding uh, than me and Jesse of the Bible. Um, and, and, and so we wanted to bring Tim on because um, we kind of mentioned, I think, in a video in the past that, that uh, we had a friend who recently encountered uh, members of the World Mission Society, and they came and asked him, uh, you know, one of the first things they will ask is, do you keep Sabbath and do you keep Passover? And you were able to say, yes, I do. You do, right? <laughs> that and, was pretty shocking. Yeah. So how did, how, tell us about that. Like, how did they react when you, when you responded that way? They were um, definitely taken off guard. I, I, I think they're so used to the normal responses that hearing that i did do that was kind of stopped them in their tracks and then they'd be like yeah but but what day do you keep Passover and yeah like the first day of the fourth yeah the 14th day of the first month and then they were silent just stared at me for like three seconds it was awkward <laughs> but I think it was just contrary to anything they'd ever run into so yep. it was it was interesting conversation so maybe tell us why why is it that you're able to say yes to that question like you're you are part of the, you said, the Hebrew Roots Movement. That's right. And so maybe t talk a little bit about what that means for you personally. Sure. Yeah, so I, I grew up a believer my whole life. Um, I was born again in the name of Jesus and uh, Baptist, uh, and my family grew up in the church and uh, grew up with good morals and good faith. Um, however, in 2011, I began to study I guess more of the Bible, and I began to feel compelled to keep the Sabbath. And I learned about the feast, so I began to keep the feast to the best of best of my ability, um, not for salvation, but because I believe that it applied to me. Um, so the Hebrew Roots Movement. Uh, before you start googling it, I would direct you to maybe find a YouTube video called "What Is Hebrew Roots" uh, by Founded in Truth Ministries. They do a really good job of. Because a lot of people search out what the Hebrew roots is, and um, he's going to be somebody that's in the Hebrew roots that's going to define it quite a bit better than some other people. So check that out if you want to. Okay. So you you keep Passover and Sabbath. Um, so maybe just kind of really quickly, maybe just tell us like because you mentioned there like you don't do it for salvation. Maybe tell, what do you mean by that? So what do you mean that you, you keep Passover and Sabbath, but you're not doing it for salvation? Sure. So I believe that when God said to do it throughout your generations and, and that all these kinds of things that it was that it applied to me, I believe that I'm grafted into Israel. I believe that all believers are. And so when God spoke it at Mount Sinai, he was speaking it to me. And, and, and uh, in, in Romans 11, we were grafted into Israel. So, so I apply it in that way that, hey, God has made these times holy and he invited me to join with him. So it's maybe the emphasis quite, isn't so much that I have to do this, it's that I get to do this. So, mm -hmm. so maybe with that perspective, uh, but, I, but I believe and preach and teach people to do it, but I don't, uh, I don't think people are going to hell for not doing it. Mm -hmm. We'll get into that more later. Yeah. So, and, and that's the interesting thing is because, um, you know, me and Jesse, um, we would, we would be in a place where we don't necessarily see eye to eye on these matters, but but the cool thing about the gospel and about what we we can stand together with Tim and say is that we we stand together as brothers and we can have complete unity in the spirit because we we believe in the testimony of the scriptures that were uh, of, uh, about who Jesus is, about the reality of who he is, that he, he is the, the way, the truth, the life. He himself is the bread of life, the living water. And, and we see also eye to eye on the, the issue of salvation being something that's a, a, a gift of God. Mm -hmm. And so this is, I think, where we would probably uh, make a distinction between key fundamental issues and secondary issues. So the, the core issues like the gospel, what the gospel is and, and what, um, what causes salvation, uh, that's a core issue. Um, the, the issue of who Jesus is and who he's not, right? And, and, and what his position is as far as his, his role in our salvation, that is something that we, you, you 
if if there's disagreement on who Jesus is, that's a div- what we would call a dividing issue, I think, right? Sure. Yeah. If if we disagree about whether, you know, a, a good example would be this group. They'll specifically say on their website and in their books, you cannot be saved in this age through the name of Jesus. So for us, <laughs> like we can stand t- together. Yeah, and it, it makes us shiver because that's so against the entire uh, the entirety of the New Testament and the, the testament of the scriptures that uh, that's not true. We so we stand together with the conviction that of who Jesus is. Um, Absolutely. And so I think what what we want to do today is I want Tim to kind of help us unpack a little bit of of the Passover. Again, this is something that so many members were getting emails uh, that are they're they're leaving this group, but Passover is one of the main things they're getting hung up over. Um, they're getting hung up on the teachings of the World Mission Society concerning Passover, and they feel that their teachings and their way of explaining their studies about Passover are so convincing, they're so compelling that um, there's no other place they can go. Like this, this must be the truth. We want to take what, again, kind of the goal of these videos and this video definitely is to focus in on some of those those um, arguments that they give to prove Passover um, is is what they say it is. Um, and we, yeah, our, our heart is that this would really help you, those of you who are coming out of this group and want to know, can I leave this group and join other churches and not be condemned to hell if I don't keep, um, if I'm not keeping Passover and Sabbath in the way that this group commands me to. Another another reason I really wanted to bring Tim on is to to show you that leaving the world and society doesn't mean you cannot you you can't keep Passover and Sabbath and observe these things and, and out of a heart of worship, um, and that's that's something that um, yeah may, maybe speak into that a little bit that that these people these people are leaving and I think so many they're so used to these concepts and they've seen you know obviously there there is some emphasis on like the Sabbath and Passover and, and the feasts and the, the importance of these, but maybe speak to these people who are coming out and they're, they're, I, I feel like, again, maybe what I'm trying to say is, is having you here kind of shows that there's, yeah. it, it doesn't have to be just this jump off and completely go into another direction, switch into a whole other I, I, uh, denomination, but there's almost like you almost, and your views can provide almost this uh, more, um, slow step into uh, into the process of leaving this group. Um, does that make sense at all? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of groups, and, and we'll talk a little bit about this more here after a little bit. But there are a lot of groups that that keep the Sabbath and keep the feasts. Um, and you know, I, I bet in your area there probably is too. I'd, I'd recommend maybe looking them up online. Reading their statement of beliefs is very important. Um, because sometimes you get some some weird groups out there. Um, but if you read their statement of beliefs and if they're rock solid, you know, on on who Jesus is or what we might often call Yeshua in the Hebrew roots, uh, which is the Hebrew word for, for Jesus, which means salvation. Um, but, you know, you find out if they're rock solid on belief in him, on who he is, deity and all that. Um, and then you can you could entertain the thought of, keeping Sabbath with them, and, and that could be a great transition point. Um, but yeah, you're not alone out there. There's a lot of people all over the place hmm. uh, scattered throughout. I know I've been to about 16 different congregations in about 10 different states, and I've got friends all over the world that uh, that keep Sabbath and keep the feasts and believe in Jesus. So yep. they're out there. And so it's it's something that I feel like one thing this group emphasizes is is that they they. F- it seems that this the World Mission Society feels that they're very unique in the fact that they keep Passover yeah. and, and Sabbath and these things. They f- they feel as if they're the only ones doing it. Yeah. Um, and so what you're telling us is that's yeah. not true in any sense. And so yeah. that not only I think are are there many other people who would who would kind of see more eye to eye with your views of Sabbath and Passover, but there's other there's many other cult groups yeah. that that keep. Um, that yep. keep these things. Um, and there were groups, you know, when we've touched on this briefly, but there are groups that, that uh, initiated Passover observance before even Aung San Hong did. Yeah. Um, Worldwide Church of God. Yes, yeah. right. So, okay, so maybe what, what we should jump into now, I think that would be helpful. That I, I, I kind of want to get your thoughts, Tim, on the Old Testament and, and 
just to kind of set the context, again, we're, we're going to jump into, we got, we got some studies sent to us. I don't know exactly what book this is from, but this is, um, I, I believe it's probably one of the sermon books, um, but it's one of the studies about Passover that we're going to look at. Uh, but first, before we do that, and before we kind of unpack the World and Society arguments and, and kind of show how they don't hold up to scrutiny, let's... I want to have you jump into the Old Testament and maybe kind of give us an overview sure. of, of, in the Old Testament, what is the purpose of keeping uh, Passover? Sure. Yeah. Um, before I even get to that, I want to just mention that when we interpret Scripture, there are three big, big rules. First one's context. Second one's context. And the third one's context. So <laughs> so we're going to try to bring in some context with different things, especially as we go through this, all of this. But I want to start out with kind of a little, a little story that is going to get into some context. And it's going to be a non-offensive story. So this, I'm not going to kill any sacred cows with this one. So I think it's just something we can learn about and be like, oh, wow, I never knew that that was, that yep. was there. So in Matthew 26, uh, verse 75... It reads, immediately a rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the word of Jesus who had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. And so we know that this is, that Jesus had told him, like, you're going to deny me three times. Yep. And uh, before the rooster crows, and, and then here this is, just as Jesus said, it happened. Peter remembered, and he's like, oh, man, I screwed up. And so, you know, clearly the Bible says that a rooster crowed that day. You can read it in English. That's what it says. You can read it in Greek. That's what it says. And you can take you can take the Greek words, take them back to the Hebrew, and it still says the same thing. Mm -hmm. However, and I'm going to be reading from an article here, and you can find it multiple sources on this online. Uh, in this article, it says the Mishnah, which is the earliest compilation of rabbinic oral law, states that roosters may not be raised in Jerusalem due to purity concerns. And it gives me two reference points. This dec decree comes from the first century when the temple stood in Jerusalem. So here the Mishnah is telling us that there were no chickens in, in Jerusalem. Hmm. So either the Mishnah's wrong, maybe, the Bible's wrong, or there was a miracle that a rooster was there. So we'll see if there's any way to reconcile. Reading from the article, the ancient Jewish sources offer a solution. In describing the activities that went on in the Jerusalem temple, the Mishnah references a specific time in the early morning. Quote, he that was minded to clean the altar of the ashes rose up early and immersed himself before the officer came. At what time did he come? Not always at the same time. Sometimes he came at cock crow and sometimes a little sooner or later. And then gives three reference points. Cock crow refers to a time early in the morning when the priests began to prepare the temple for daily visitors. Hmm. Another quote, every day they used to remove the ashes from the altar, from off the altar at Cockrow or near to it, either before it or after it. And it does not mean a rooster crow, but rather the blast from a trumpet at the temple that announced the time. Quote, at Cockrow they blew a sustained, a quavering, and another sustained blast. In other words, a Cockrow refers to a time early in the morning when a trumpet signaled the beginning of the day for work in the temple. So here we have kind of a redefining of, of and this is what we would call an idiom. So in, it literally means a cock crow. However, sometimes literally things aren't what they seem. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so they found an excavation in the corner of the temple mount in Jerusalem with an uncovered stone bearing the Hebrew inscription. It says, to the place of trumpeting. And scholars have suggested the stone marked an area on the southwest corner of the Temple Mount facing toward the city where priests could blow trumpets announcing different times of the day and the week. It seems reasonable that this stone marked the location of the cock road. The evangelists assumed that their readers understood the cultural and spiritual world of ancient Judaism. Therefore, they did not explain much of the language hmm. and details. The task of the modern reader of the Gospels is to read the Gospels within the language of the culture and the spiritual world of ancient Judaism because sometimes a rooster is not a rooster. So everyone you've ever met has, you know, envisioned a physical rooster. Um, but given this, we can now see that perhaps it wasn't. And you can believe that it was a physical rooster or you can not, it doesn't matter. But this, this is just to give you the idea that sometimes we have to study that like if you only read the Bible, you would never come away thinking that that was a trumpet blast. Mm -hmm. But extra biblical sources and cultural things 
can help us understand a better context and maybe even a more truthful view of what really happened. So that was an innocent little contextual mm -hmm. story that, you know, none of you are going to be too upset that you <laughs> learned that maybe it wasn't a rooster that yep. was crying. I've never heard that. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Just a kind of an interesting little thing. And I'll, I'll probably bring up other contextual things that might be a little bit more painful, but for that, for now, that was just an introductory thing. So with Passover, um, you know, Passover is instituted originally in, in Exodus chapter 12. Um, Egypt, the Hebrew word for Egypt is Mitzrayim, which means tribulation or trouble. So here you have this nation that's in the midst of a land of trouble. And within that land, they were under slavery. And uh, so that, you know, it's a time of trial that they're going through. So in Exodus chapter 12, God is about to deliver them, as we know, from Egypt. And you guys have all heard this story, but from Egypt, he's going to deliver them. So he tells them to slaughter a lamb and put the blood on the doorpost. In the ancient times, there was something known as a threshold covenant. You can look up more about this online if you want. There's books read about it. But it was actually a practice, cultural practice, where you would, you would, put, you would slaughter an animal at the threshold of a house and the blood would run down into a basin. And so you would do that when you're going to have guests over. You would step over the threshold, never on it. That would be dishonoring to the people that own the home. But if you were to pass through that threshold into, your, into the home and you had these guests come in, you had a legal responsibility to take care of these guests. And so there's already this kind of cultural aspect going on. Hmm. Uh, this, and th this, was a, this was a custom this at was the a, time, a, an ancient custom in in Israel, or, well, well, or in, in the ancient within, lands. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. And it's you can call it's called the threshold covenant. There's books written about it and teachings on it and so forth. You can look that up. Um, and so this actually um, a really good example of this is actually um, with Lot when he was in Sodom. Okay. He had his guests come into his home. There's there's an, any mention of a slaughtering of an animal, but but the concept of really needing to defend. Yep. The people that are your guests is there. And so what we have with, back to Exodus 12, we have, you know, this this guy, this Passover lamb that's shed its blood. And so now it's actually going to be that God protects the people within there. Instead of them protecting their guests, God is, in a sense, protecting them from what is outside. So he's creating a barrier, in a sense. And some some Jewish commentators believe that, you know, a lot of movies will show, like, that the destroyer goes up to the door, mm -hmm. sees the blood, and he moves on. The Prince of Egypt. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that Ten Commandments movie. Yep. Um, it doesn't specifically say this, and you can reject this if you want to, um, but it is believed amongst some Jewish, many Jewish commentators that that God entered into the home and He covered them, kind of like a uh, the wings of a, of, mm -hmm. a, of a hen over her chicks. That he that was the that was the Pesach or the Passover is that he covered them to protect them so he entered into their home with them hmm. so that's kind of the the way that they interpret um, some of them interpret that that action and so from there um, obviously they they're saved they're redeemed the blood you know that saved the firstborn um, and so then they're able to leave the land of Egypt, the land of trouble. And so the redemption price had been paid. The blood of the lamb redeemed the firstborn. So that's, that's the basic physical um, storyline that we have. And then we're told to memorialize that story and tell our children. Which is where? Where does he say to memorialize it? It's in Deuteronomy, right? Um, also in Deuteronomy, but it's also immediately in uh, Exodus chapter 12, okay. towards the end of it. He tells them. You know, you're going to do this throughout your generations and memorialize it. Okay. Yeah. So we fast forward ahead to uh, the ministry of Yeshua or Jesus. Um, and he's about to bring about um, something that we might call, it's never specifically mentioned in the Bible in this terminology, but it would be called the second exodus or a greater exodus. So in Luke 9, 30 through 31, we're on the Mount of Transfiguration. And the verse says, suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to Jesus. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. This Greek word for departure is 
the word exodus. So hmm. this is this is kind of tying in this this concept of an exodus of this um, this big event, um, and so uh, Yeshua is going to enter in, or Jesus is going to enter into Jerusalem on the tenth of Nisan, the tenth day of the first month, just as a lamb was supposed to enter the household of an Israelite on the tenth day of the first month. Exodus twelve three tells us, "Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of the month, every man shall take a lamb according to his father's house." a lamb for every household. Thus, Jesus came into the city and was was inspected, kind of like a lamb is inspected to make sure it's perfect, while Jesus was also inspected by the religious elite. This is in Matthew 22. So first he is questioned by the Pharisees, then by the Sadducees, then by the scribes, uh, which actually is brought up in this book. So we'll we'll get into that here soon. and he answers them perfectly, being a faultless lamb. So soon after that, then on the 14th of Nisan, which is Passover, he's having this last supper with his disciples. And uh, he's doing it just as the Jews were supposed to do it. Uh, because in, yeah, I think it's Exodus 12, 14. This day shall be a memorial for you. You shall keep it as a feast of the Lord throughout your generations as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast that's what Exodus 12, 14 says. And then to tie that in, to give us even more details of it, is Deuteronomy 16, 1 through 8, um, which tells us in order to keep the Passover, we must keep it on the 14th day of the first month. Number two is sacrifice a lamb at the place where the Lord chooses, which would later on be Jerusalem. And number three says, don't eat leavened bread, eat leavened bread for seven days. Verse, verse 5 tells us you must not sacrifice the lamb wherever you want to. Verse 6, but only in the place where he said his name. There you will sacrifice it in the evening. Verse 7 says, roast the lamb and eat it in the place the Lord cho- chose, which is Jerusalem. So Jesus is doing this. He's in Jerusalem. I imagine that he had them slaughter that lamb there at the temple, just as he was supposed to. Then they're going to go eat this meal together. So he keeps it with his disciples, never straying from it. However, he is giving further and deeper meaning to the symbols of the Jewish Seder. He's instructing his disciples now that when they drink the wine and eat the matzah, he's to remember the blood of the covenant, the new exodus. And so in a Jewish Seder, you have a plate that has all these symbolic items on it. And then you always tell the story of you drink some bitter waters to remember the bitterness of the slavery. You have you eat lamb to remember the lamb that was slain. Uh, you have all these different symbols. However, Jesus, when he's when he's doing this meal with them, he's redirecting it, not necessarily to take away from the fact that mm-hmm. there was a physical exodus from Egypt. We ought not to forget that. However, he's redirecting something greater, hmm. uh, and that is that you know his body is these symbols. These mm-hmm. symbols are becoming you know because the the matzah is this flatbread. I'm sure they're they're probably familiar with this, but it's this flatbread that has often got burn marks in it and it's got puncture wounds and so we say it's got the bruises of messiah it's got pierced just like messiah was Uh, it's stripes and so it's by his stripes we are healed there's all this beautiful imagery Mm -hmm. of this unleavened bread this sinless bread that we get to partake Mm -hmm. of so he is redirecting it it did have meaning for the first exodus but it has even greater meaning Mm -hmm. for uh for jesus and so there's a key verse here um, that they use when when I had the, the members here at my house. Yep. It's Matthew twenty six twenty eight. So they they brought this up yeah. when um, pretty pretty quickly on when we were discussing things. Yep. And they used the NIV, um, and it says, "This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, for the forgiveness of sins." So that's the NIV version. Uh, I would contend that the NIV is not the greatest version. That's, I mean, you, can, you can get the core message, yeah. generally speaking. What version do you like? Um, multiple versions. I use something called the scriptures, but uh, in a, in a SB in would a SB, be a pretty yeah. good one. Pretty uh, NIV was better back in the 80s. Yeah. Um, but what they've done here, and a lot of versions do this, so I can't just... You know, but they, they've taken the word forgiveness, but the Greek word for there is aphesis. Now, Ephesus, if you look it up, it's Strong's number 859. Ephesus is more accurately translated as remission or liberation. Well, what does that mean? Well, 
we can take the Ephesus Greek word and we can tie it back in to a Hebrew word that is apparent in the Hebrew scriptures. And this will give us a greater understanding as what this terminology is leading towards. The Hebrew root of Ephesus is Yovel. And in English, we would read that as Jubilee. So this is a Jubilee from sin. In, in Leviticus 25, the whole, con, the whole chapter for context, but just for the sake of, um, I'm just going to read 10 and 11. Maybe before you, ju- I've got that word pulled up. It's interesting because it's in, in the Strong's concordance, it's eight, uh, 859, but it's ascending away, a letting, a letting go, a release, pardon. Mm-hmm. So you're you're kind of pointing back. This is this is this is the Exodus. This is the greater Exodus we're seeing. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. That's yeah. interesting. And because the Jubilee in Leviticus twenty five is described as you are to make the fiftieth year holy and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It is a jubilee to you, which each of you is to return to his own property, and each of you to return to his family. That fiftieth year will be your jubilee. So here we see freedom, we see liberation. And what is he referring to? The blood of the covenant isn't exactly forgiving sins. He was already doing that. When he would heal people, he could forgive them. He already had the authority to forgive mm-hmm. sins. But this is a this is a return, this is a release, and this is freedom from the power of sin. This is my contention to you, is that that this moment, this this setting up is is the kingdom of darkness is being defeated. It's going to be defeated by the blood of the Lamb on that on that cross to make a greater exodus from sin and be free from sin. Hmm. Forgiveness, you know, we're going to talk more about what we do for forgiveness here soon, but but I think that this conversation is is a bigger picture of of the the stronghold the, the stronghold that sin has over us. We get to have freedom from that. Hmm. So and so it's a deliverance the he's he's symbolizing through the last supper symbolizing uh, that this is the greater exodus. And it's, it's not an emphasis only on the fact that we get our sins forgiven, but it's more, you're, you're saying more an emphasis on the fact that we get delivered from our slavery, our bondage yeah. to sin, not just outward actions, but the internal state of our hearts. We, we, what Jesus has done, what he's showing the disciples symbolically is that through my flesh, through my blood, through the, the what I am doing in the work I'm in the, on the cross, I am I am basically is like the greater parting of the Red Sea, right? Yeah. It's like this is this is yeah. the true parting of the Red Sea, where like you're internally you got sin and condemnation, you know, before you and behind you is condemnation, kind of of, of the yeah. wrath of God almost, Absolutely. and and Jesus is the one who has come and parted the the red sea so that we can pass through and so that's yeah that's great and something that you know maybe before you move on there that i just want to point out is is you brought up the fact that here in the last supper jesus is instituting reinstituting what they would say the 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 passover the new covenant um what's what's interesting that you just touched on is that people were already forgiven prior to this the disciples were already forgiven, right? Like you see before they ate the supper, he washed them and said, you're clean, right? You're already clean. Yeah. Um, if you go back to Mark 2, 9, you know, you see Jesus he- healing the the paralytic, the paralyzed man. And he says, your sins are forgiven. The interesting thing is that he, this, this man was not instructed by Jesus to, to go and keep Passover. Yeah. <laughs> and he didn't say, now, listen, I've healed you. I know you need sins forgiven, so what you need to do is is I'm going to provide this Passover yeah. bread and wine. You yeah, need to and you got to wait till the first month. You got to do it on a certain day. day. That might be 11 months from now, so hopefully you don't die. Yes, in the meantime. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's yeah. ridiculous. <laughs> so that's something that yeah that I I think is worth thinking about yeah. is that you look at the the Gospels and there's many 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 examples of people already being forgiven, um, completely independent from from them observing any form of this Passover, uh, this, this eating of the bread and drinking the wine. So absolutely. Yeah. And that was pretty much my final point. I was going to just mention that Hebrews nine, where it says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. It uses that same Greek word, ephesus. Uh, so it's that release. Without that the shedding of blood, there's no, the word, for, I think some translations will say there's no remission of, or no forgiveness of sins. Yeah, so that word basically is there's no exodus, there's no freedom. From, there's no freedom. There's no deliverance from the bondage of sin. Exactly. 
Wow. So maybe to sum that up, just sum up kind of in a nutshell then what that means about what what is the purpose of the Passover in the Old Testament and, and how does that then apply to what the purpose is in the New Testament? Yeah, so the the purpose in the Old Testament, um, and I and I still think it has value today, is, is to remember that God delivered us, did deliver our forefathers in a really mighty way from tribulation uh, as they were in the land of tribulation in slavery. Um, and God delivered us through mighty wonders, and we can look to Him, and He saved He saved our people um, in a mighty way. And then we were told to memorialize that every year we look back, we teach our kids, uh, you know, God did this, and then in the New Testament, or or when Messiah came, and He and He gave us even greater meaning, He brought fullness of meaning to it. Um, and so that now when we sit there at that Passover table, we get, we get to talk about not only the physical, like, wow, our, our forefathers were slaves, but, but also, like, I can tell my son, I don't have any children yet, but when I do, I get to tell him, like, I was, I was a slave unto addiction of different kinds. I was a slave unto this and that, but, but the Lord has released me from it. He has saved me from it hmm. uh, by, by what Jesus did on the cross, and he has saved me. Um, and redeem me in that way. And so I get to take these symbols and relate them to the Messiah mm -hmm. um, in a more meaningful way. So for you then, you're, you're observing the Passover, you, you physically going through a process of, of making that bread, drinking that wine. When you're doing that, what you're doing is, is it's what I, and correct me if I'm wrong, but when I hear you say that, what I see you saying is that's an act of worship. It's an act mm -hmm. of, yeah. it's an act of worship and, and remembering, but you're remembering which produces in you a heart of worship for something that God has already done already for you. Done. Oh yeah, that's it, a great way to put it. it. It's yeah. not an action that you're doing so that you can coerce God or convince God to do something for you that he has not yet done. In other words, yeah. I'm going to do this and in that's, turn, that's God's really going idea. to... Yeah to pay me back with salvation. Yeah. It's it's actually an act of worship. It's something that you do in response to something that God has already done. And it reminds you of that. And it brings your heart and your mind into alignment with that truth. Yes, that is a great way to put it. Yeah. Good. So yeah. what that makes me think of, and I think maybe this is the next point, is it makes me think of the words of Jesus at the Last Supper, which is what they so, again, these scriptures that they so emphasize What's interesting is um, we look at Luke um, chapter 22. Okay, and so let, let me just read here. I'm going to start in, in verse uh, 17. So it says, after taking the cup, he gave thanks. Um, and he said, take this, divide it among yourselves, for I tell you that I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given it for you do this in remembrance of me. So to me, like, and, and this is something probably we'll get into a little bit more in detail, but if the Passover is something that Jesus was commanding as a requirement for eternal life, for salvation, in other words, if Jesus was saying, look, guys, this is something you have to do continually on the right, at, at the right time, or else you cannot have a right relationship with God. God cannot embrace you as his child you cannot be counted righteous you can't have righteousness credited to you as as it was to abraham um, if that's the case if that's what he was commanding here concerning passover then my question and the question we we ask continually is why didn't he say mm -hmm. that why why when he had the the chance here in, in in verse 19 again of luke 19 or luke 22 he says do this not for the forgiveness of sins he doesn't say do this so that you can be counted righteous before God. He says, do this as an act of remembrance. And I think this goes right back to what we were just saying, that yeah. when you when you do this, that's a, you're, you're obeying this, this command of Jesus to remember him, to remember what he's done. I would, I would propose that to do this for salvation, to do this as an act of trying to earn God's forgiveness is actually disobedience to this. Would you agree with that? Would you, you think there's? Well, sure. Yeah. I mean, that, I think that's, that's, a, that's what we would call 
an idiom would be to violence against his word. It would mm-hmm. be to butcher his word, to contort it, to make it sound yep. that it's, you know, that's, that's doing violence to the word of God. Which, which is an interesting thing to think about because I think for us standing on this side, it's so many WMSCOG members, one of the main accusations I get and that you're probably going to get is that, well, you guys just, you deny the commandments of Jesus. You just, you, you teach like a, a too easy version of salvation, which is just believe and then kind of do whatever you want, which and another thing we're going to get into more, but, yeah. but I would say in reply to that, actually, if you're keeping Passover, if you're doing this as an act by which you think you are earning salvation, you're earning and meriting favor from God, I would say you're actually the ones who are standing in a place of disobeying what Jesus says the purpose of Passover is. Um, So with that, I know you had some things you wanted to talk about in regards to this. So maybe jump into that and well, I was gonna go on to. You want to go on to this? Okay. Yeah. If you're, if yeah you're let's to... let's go on and jump into this. So again, I don't know what what book this is from, and you guys, when you hear us talking about this, you might you might recognize this uh, specific study. But this is a study. This comes from. Do you want to do chapter six or seven first? Which seven first? Just because okay. that was the way that I read it. First. Okay. Yeah. Let's do that. So, working so, a little backwards. But... <laughs> So this is from chapter seven of a book. We don't know which one. Uh, this is from the world. One of the one of I, I, again. I'm assuming a sermon book. And this chapter is called "You Shall Have No Other Gods Before Me." And it's it's one of their chapters and one of their studies in which they try to prove Passover is what they'll say is is really some pretty disturbing things about. In, in the way that they emphasize the Passover and the way they glorify it and they centralize it. Um, so yeah. maybe share uh, your thoughts on this. Sure, yeah. So like you said, the chapter is, is titled, You Shall Have Another God Before Me. Um, the f- first sub- subsection underneath it uh, says, what is the first commandment? And here they were going to make the simple claim that the first commandment of the Ten Commandments is the first commandment. Now, everyone reading that is going to surely say, of course, amen. Uh, however, they're going to lead us down this false strand of logic by pointing out the seemingly obvious truth. So if you just redefine words a little bit, you can go off track just a little bit. And if you go long enough, you're going to find yourself way off track. Mm. And we're going to find ourselves going way off track here very soon with this with this book. So they make the claim that the f- phrase first commandment is indicating the first of the Ten Commandments. Then they go and they quickly go to Matthew 22, where the f- phrase originated. We kind of spoke of Matthew 22 just briefly, just a moment ago. This is where Jesus was being put on trial, in a sense, uh, by the Pharisees first, then the Sadducees, and then the third time by the scribes. And so now he's going to be questioned by the scribes. So they have, they have underneath here uh, Matthew 22, 35 through 38. And then it says, uh, which one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question, teacher, which of which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and the great commandment. So they, they stop right there. Hmm. They don't say the next two verses. Well, I'm going to read the next two verses real quick. Yep. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So they, they stopped it short because it was convenient for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they're, then they're going to talk about, they're going to tie this in together. But Jesus isn't talking about the first of the Ten Commandments, as you noticed here. Uh, it isn't a part of the conversation. The question was asked, which is the great commandment in the law? And he responds with the great commandment and says it's the first. Why the first? Because he was about to say the second greatest commandment is love the Lord or love your neighbor as yourself. This is the one, too, he's talking about. The, this book conveniently neglects that part of the conversation where Yeshua talks about the so second why, commandment. So why is it that you think they neglect that? Why would they Cause they're, pass over it? <laughs> they're, they're not intended. Yeah, they're, they're going, yeah, there you go. <laughs> they're going to do some, I don't know, there's probably a term for this, but they're going to be really cherry-picking a lot of verses and just taking you from mm-hmm. one to the next to the next and kind of jump around. Mm-hmm. And they're going to sh- they're going to take terminologies and say, see, the first and the greatest are the same thing. Now let's go somewhere over here yeah. where it says the great command, yeah. greatest. It really, the, you you see in this study, the, the sleight of hand is what yeah. we always call it. It's yeah. a sleight of hand 
way of, of interpreting the scripture, which is um, eisegesis instead of exegesis, mm-hmm. which you can look into those terms. Those are terms about uh, how we approach studying the Bible. But, um, you know, I, I see that in another place uh, where it gets into King Josiah and they, they you can tell they specifically leave out that they'll, they'll go up to like verse 23, like 21 to 23, and then they'll jump over to 25. And if you stop and actually focus on it, you'll realize, wait a minute, they dropped out 24. <laughs> and you find out, well, there's a there's a really specific reason for that. It's yeah. because just like we just read, they dropped out the verses about, you know, loving your neighbor as yourself because they don't they don't help in their their attempts to show that Passover is is, is the emphasis of what Jesus is trying to get across. And and they want they want what they're trying to do is they're trying to uh, they're they're convoluting the scriptures to try to squeeze out of them this focus, this primary focus on Passover. Um, if yeah. you look at uh, uh, Jew Cho Kim in his books, he'll say things about how the Passover is the central uh, theme of the Bible. It's the core truth of the Bible. That's what they're trying to manipulate the scriptures. And that that's that's exactly what they're doing. I'm, I'm not going to shy away from they're manipulating yeah. the scriptures to I try call to that spiritual abuse. Yeah, yeah. To put this emphasis on Passover that the Bible does not itself put on it. And so and some of the ways they, they'll do that is they will not stay, like you said, context, context, context. They will <laughs> jump away from the context by uh, blatantly just dropping out verses in yeah. the in the middle of this this the text that they they focus on to prove Passover they'll just drop out verses here and there because if they leave them in it does not serve it actually distracts from their their purpose so yeah and just just as a reminder I'm assuming that you guys know but I'll, I'll mention it the, the first commandment is or the we what we often call the first commandment is you shall have no other gods before me so they're they're equating the con the idea of of uh, you shall have no other gods before me, and they're equating that with the greatest commandment that Jesus just described is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And you can see a connection between the two in a sense, um, but they're they're going to do some manipulation, like mm-hmm. we just said here soon. So the next subsection is titled "The Passover Enables Us to Love Only God." In this subsection, they continue to use the term "the first commandment," all the while they are actually referring to the greatest commandment. This slight variation terminology could lead someone just barely off track. A slight deviation from truth over a long period of time or over a long strand of logic, as I might say, can bring us miles or years away from the truth. So I'm going to interject with some context again. Uh, Jews in the first century had figured out that the command to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, and resources was the most important command. This is why it is sa- says in Matthew 22 that an expert in the law tested him. Because he already knew the answer. A famous Pharisee named Hillel was once asked to teach an uneducated man in the law while standing on one foot. So in other words, this uneducated man came to him and was just wanting a quick summary because you can only talk for so long while standing on one foot. Mm -hmm. So um, Hillel wisely said, love God and love your neighbor. The rest is commentary. Hillel lived uh, a few generations before Yeshua. In fact, his grandson was Gamaliel, which was the rabbi for Paul. So here's kind of the connection here, because you, you see Gamaliel mentioned in Scripture, mm-hmm. I think twice in Acts and also uh, one of the letters. So in the culture at the time, it was well known to interpret the law as having the least, or what we might call the lightest, uh, or in the heavy commandments, which would be the greatest. So so think of that in weight of the weight of it. And this is very important. We'll bring this up more later. Um, and so the greatest we've already uncovered, the least of the commandments, um, you can try to guess, you probably never would. It's kind of an obscure one, but this is what this is what the Jewish uh, commentators have always uh, listed as the they least. They categorize the this as the least. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it's Deuteronomy 22, 6 through 7. It says, if you happen to come upon a bird's nest along the way, in any tree or on the ground with young ones or eggs and the mother sitting on the young or on the eggs you shall not take the mother with the young you shall certainly let the mother go but the young you may take for yourself in order that may be well with you and you may prolong your days so here we have the greatest commandment love the lord your god with all your heart soul and strength and then you get the least of it if you find a bird (laughs) sure away and then take the eggs yeah so there's there's weight there's weight Mm. not all commandments are the same it's that's crucial 
that there is a weightiness mm-hmm. to them. And so, and we're going to find throughout scripture, uh, when he describes the, the weightier matters of the law in Matthew, I didn't put this down here, but in Matthew 23, when he's uh, refuting, the, giving the woes to the Pharisees, he's telling them justice, mercy, and truth. Yep. The weightier matters he, he of the ta- law. Yeah, he talks about this because he talks about how they, they abandon, like, yeah. well, he'll say something about how they're, they strain out a gnat and swallow a camel right. and their focus on Basically, what they were doing is focusing on these less weighty yeah, matters, yeah, exactly. and they were they were taking the less weighty things and exalting them yep. to. They're putting them in the wrong place. Exactly. Basically, they're putting them in a category that God did not put them in. Yeah, absolutely. And what that did is it created it created the Pharisees. It created who they were. It created their their heart activity of hatred, basically toward yeah. toward the, the poor and the broken, and their their self righteous attitude um it w- was the result of them basically adding to or taking away yeah. from god's law by yeah. twisting it yeah. and emphasizing things and they were yeah they were using it emphasize. yeah they were using it for their own personal gain which mm-hmm. is pretty much the exact opposite of what god was really trying to teach his people yes so if you're going to love your you're going to provide the needs for them yep. you're going to be selfless you know and try to be helpful to others but they were doing the exact opposite hmm. So, so remember, in the minds of the people that heard the Gospel of Matthew, they were familiar with the idea of least and greater commandments and categorizing them differently than the Ten Words on the tablets, which are often called the Ten Commandments. The Bible never calls them the Ten Commandments by name. They are simply known as the Ten Words or Ten utter- Utterances. In Hebrew, it's Aseret Hadevarim. And that's a little bit important. We'll bring that up here soon on why that's kind of important. So back to this Wimscog book. Uh, and they take Wimscog, the, can we call him that? I, I, I would, yeah, I think that's easier. I hope it's not offensive, but it's easier in WMSCOG or it just takes too long. Wimscog. Wimscog. Okay. From now on, there you go. <laughs> uh, so then they go to reader to, they take the reader to 2 Kings 23, uh, where Josiah finds the book of the law and repents and tears down all the idols and instructs his people to do what the law of Moses says. Um, this is a great chapter. I love this chapter. I mean, I can go to it real quick. So, so should I read that real quick? So they what they bring up, and this goes right along with what you're saying, is Second Kings twenty three twenty five, where Tom, Josiah says, "Neither before nor after Josiah was there any king like him, who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his strength, according to all the law of Moses." So what the, what they're doing here, right? Is they're 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 you can tell they kind of scan the Old Testament to find where does the Old Testament talk about Passover. Let's go to those places mm. where they talk about Passover. Let's see if we can manipulate what it says to make it seem as if Passover is the, the core of the Bible. Let's yeah. see if we can find these places like 2 Kings 23, 25, where Passover is mentioned. We're going to find that and, and we're going to see if we can twist it around enough to where it looks like it, it's it's saying Passover basically is the core of the Bible. It's the core message of God, and it's the the, the method, God's way of salvation, pretty much. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so they they jump they immediately. They mention verse twenty five, which you know, which is which is nice. And he just read it, but but it really it's really important to read the entire chapter and maybe set up like just just really quick what's mm-hmm. the context here what's the context of Josiah what's happening here uh, kind of sure. set the stage for for why they even bring up Josiah so Josiah was was prof- he was a young king but he was he was kind of prophesized generations before that he was going to come and 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 do some good things um, but he comes in and he he discovers um, the book of the law and the book of the covenant uh, that had been basically lost and neglected forever. And so then he reads it and he's like, oh my gosh, uh, you know, this has been, you know, this is what we're supposed to be doing. So they repented, the whole nation really repented. Um, and they, they go and they, they start to, I mean, they start tearing down the idols, the Asherah poles, the, they just, just all sorts of stuff. They do an, an assortment of different things. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, this is this is where I found that they kind of they cherry pick here because mm-hmm. because Josiah, after he found this book of the law that had been lost, obviously he he started 
bringing Israel back into alignment with the book of the law. Yeah. And that involved exactly. an assortment of things. Yeah. But what the only thing they emphasize here the is best. the fact that he, he restored Passover, which was a good thing. Yeah. Obviously, that was good. But he did many other things. And I think what's emphasized more than Passover in this chapter is the fact that he... He tore down idols and he de desecrated the, the high places, it will say. Yeah. Um, the, the, basically, these places they had set up as as places of worship to false gods, to false deities, mm -hmm. and were offering up their hearts to worship these, these beings that were not God. They were not Yahweh. And and so, yeah, and so this is this is one of the places, actually, that, that I was referencing to earlier where they bring up, you know, they emphasize Passover, but they drop off the verses kind of that that emphasize the other things that that Josiah yeah. did at the same time. Yeah, I mean it was it was the whole picture is why he is listed as knowing that he loved the Lord's God because he because because when we encounter the word of God, it ought to change our whole lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're not we we ought not to to do this one ritual and and think that that's that pleases God. He his entire life became you know, different when he encountered mm -hmm. the Word of God, and so and that's that's a beautiful picture, and I, and I, I love it. Um, so that's that's interesting what you just said there, because this concludes. It talks about all the things Josiah did, and I, I'm probably cutting you off. Is probably no. what you're getting into, but it talks about all the things Josiah did in restoring, basically, and again, and bringing Israel back into alignment with God's law. And Passover was one of the things, but it, there was also the tearing down of idols, the, the the all these other things that Josiah did. And at the conclusion of that, verse 25, which we just read, it says, nobody, there is nobody before or after Josiah who loved God and, and turned with all of his heart as he did, yeah. something to that extent. Yeah. Here's here's how they cherry pick, though, is what they do is they focus on that one point where where it's it talks about Passover, that he restored the Passover. And they say, see, Josiah's restoration of the Passover is equal to him loving God with all of his heart. And they conveniently leave out, you know, verses uh, 24 and, and other places where it talks about the other things Josiah yeah. did that equated, that ultimately equates to this statement about him in verse 25, that he loved God with all of his heart. It wasn't, what I'm saying is it wasn't just the fact that he restored Passover that made him somebody who was defined as loving God with all of his heart. And that's at the core of this study. That's what they're trying to yeah. manipulate the scriptures to say. And it just doesn't say that. Yeah. I, my, yeah. That, like I, my biggest, I guess, difference of perspective on, on it from, from what they're doing is, is, is like, kind of like you're saying their, their emphasis is so much on, on Passover. Mine is this, mine is that he, he returned to the law of Moses, which is what 25 said. There was no king, like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his might, according to the law of Moses. So he did everything he could, everything that, he, that was right there before him as he's reading it, like, oh my gosh, we're not supposed to have these spiritists and these, these people doing witchcraft. Like, let's get them out of here. Mm -hmm. and idolatry, like the fornication, like, oh man, we got to cut the stuff out. Yep. It's, it's, it's the whole picture. It's, it's the a whole picture. That shows a repentant yep. heart. Yep. <laughs> so if you, actually, if you follow the logic, if you want to use this, this passage of scripture of Second Kings, to define what the first and greatest commandment is, which is what they're, this is what they're trying to do yeah. here. They're trying to say, look at Second Kings 23, look at the, the story of Josiah, and you will learn what the core of the Bible is, what, what God's way of salvation is. And you see that by what Josiah did and the fact that what he did leads to the definition of him, that he loved God with all of his heart, mind, soul, and strength. If you follow that reasoning, then you have to look at the other scriptures too. And you have to say, well, the first and greatest commandment is also like right what you said, casting out sorcerers and the and the people yeah. doing witchcraft and the, the and going and crushing the Asherah poles and their the the idols and yeah. and so I would say like if you're really keeping the first commandment, if if this is defining the first commandment as they're trying to say then I would say you should be, you know, going out in the streets and like tearing down the Hollywood sign and <laughs> like demolishing <laughs> movie theaters and these these idols you know that you would that 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 uh you might say are the modern day idols in the world you you need to follow this whole thing like you cannot just cherry pick and say oh well josiah kept the passover that's that must be the first and greatest commandment uh that that's that's cherry picking that's eisegesis. jesus that's not that's a again like you said that's abusing that's an abuse of the scriptures yeah, yeah the, I, I guess if you were to 
if you were to sum up, and so they're trying to sum it up into that he kept Passover, in the most simplistic terms, he heard the word of the Lord and he did. You hear mm-hmm. and do is, is like this concept throughout scripture. Mm-hmm. Um, those, you know, those who hear and obey, you know, those are my mother and brothers. That's what Jesus yeah, that's said. That's good, yeah. You know, and, and that's and that's throughout. That's that's Deuteronomy 6, 3, like hear and do. Yep. Uh, and that's Isaiah what, that's 55, what which is another key place that they use to try to, they try to argue for David, you know, David, the David prophecy being a, uh, being fulfilled by Hong Song Hong. Well, Isaiah 55 is all about here. It says here and your soul will live. It says, why do you spend your money on uh, what is not bread? And, 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 and uh, basically Isaiah 55 that they try to use to, again, to prove these concepts. Um, ultimately what it does is it gets to like the freeness of the gospel. It, it tells us that God offers us something that is, it's without money and without prices. I think the words it uses. Um, yeah. Yeah. So just to, I guess, sum, summarize what we've seen so far is that they've, they say the first commandment or what they've got going wrong for them so far, I would say, is the first commandment concept is inaccurate that they're teaching. And also Josiah didn't keep the first commandment by keeping Passover. Mm-hmm. He he kept Passover because it was a part of, it's a part of him repenting and turning to the Lord. It's one of the many things that he did. Yeah. Um, so these are some of the ways they're getting off track a little bit. Uh, we'll go to the next page. In there. So here they're going to go and they're, um, they say, to confirm it, let us study about the relationship between the first commandment and the Passover in the Bible. So then they quote Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 8. This is a, this is a very famous uh, part of scripture. Um, it is... Uh, this is something that Jews recite daily. A lot of them do. This is known as the Shema, because in Hebrew it's the Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, uh, which is here, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And then after that, they go into the great commandment. Um, and then, so they quote that verse, and then they say, uh, "What words should we tie as symbols on our hands and bind on our foreheads?" It is, this, and again, this is out of this is out of the Wumskogs study what yeah. you're you're reading i just want to make make sure that's yeah yeah clear uh and then it said well what are they going to bind on their hands and bind on their foreheads uh it is love your lord with all your god with all your soul with all your strength so that's an that's you know if you're just reading that you you could you could easily make that assumption however it's the context is is important here um so when they're going to say you know verse six of this phrase of deuteronomy six four if you're at home get Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 8. On verse 6, it starts off saying, these words I command you this day shall be upon your heart. Uh, The book says, in the book here, it actually says these commandments. Uh, These commandments that I get you today are to be upon your heart. Yeah, which is inaccurate. That's not what the Bible says. And that's important because they like to, they're going to take us in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. Um, But a little bit. But um, so... So what are the words that should be on our heart? And what do we teach our children? What do we talk about when we lie down, rise up? It's my strong opinion that this passage is referring to what Moses just spoke about in chapter 5. So you have to go to chapter 5 to understand what chapter 6 is talking about. Uh, and this this is something, again, for the record, and this is already clear, this is something that they will not do. This is a method of studying the Bible that you will not, if you're in this church, if you've been in there long enough, you'll, you, you'll know they will not use this method of studying the scripture. And the method I mean is they're not going to look at chapter six and the, the, the scriptures that, that are before them and say, well, what's the context of yeah. this? Let's go back to five. Let's see if there's a train of thought here that the author has that he's trying to get to. This is something, this is a, the way of studying the Bible that they avoid, yeah. um, which is a problem. And it, it yeah. results in all these very problematic doctrines. Yeah. Yeah. So the, what is in Deuteronomy chapter 5, 6 through 21, is what we would popularly call the Ten Commandments, which are the, the Ten Words. They are retelling of the Ten Words, which were originally spoken at Mount Sinai in Exodus 20. Uh, the verse, the last verse after, you know, 6 through 21 goes through the commandments. But then on, on verse 10, it says these words. Um, you know, where is it? On yours? Yeah. And you said verse 10? Sorry, verse 22, but it says these, these words. 
Okay. And these words is a reference to the famous Ten Commandments. In the ancient days, that's what you put on your doorpost. That makes the most sense. If you put on your doorpost, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind, you get some stranger coming through. They're like, that's abstract. But if you come up to the door doorpost or the gates of a city and it says, you shall have no other gods before Jehovah. You shall have no idols. You shall not make Jehovah's name in vain. And you shall honor, keep the seven. Honor your father and mother. Honor your, you, you have this. This is, this is in the ancient times. That's what you put at the city gates. The law of Hammurabi or the code of Hammurabi was on the ancient gates of the cities. This, this is how. You, this is what you know. These are the rules, kind of in a sense. Mm -hmm. So this this is what these words are. So that's first. I just want to make sure that's verse twenty two of chapter five that you're yeah. referencing. Okay. Yeah. And so every, every time you hear the word, like you see these words, and this one says these are the commandments. Is that? Yeah. That's inaccurate. Inaccurate. Okay. So is that? I wonder if that's the, the NIV version. Okay. That's, so yeah. let's see if the N NASB. Yes. So these, these words. words. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So it, yeah, command. It's yeah they're. Yeah. Anyhow. Um, okay. Th interesting. So this is this the fact that it's not commandments but words is going to allow us to actually unpack and understand in chapter six. Yeah. What he's getting at when he says these words. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Shall be upon your heart. Okay. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Yeah. yeah. That's he's referring back to what he just talked about. He just talked about it in chapter five. It transitions to chapter six. He's it's still it's all a part of the same section of, mm -hmm. of thought for what Moses is saying. Um, so yeah, the, anyway, and then there are many commandments. Traditionally, there are 613 commandments. All the commandments can be summed up in the 10 and summed up even more into the two greatest commandments, love God and love your neighbor. And that's why Jesus said, you know, like the first greatest, love Lord God with all your heart, soul, and might. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says right after he says, you know, and the, and all, and the rest of the commandments hang on hang on this on mm -hmm. these two commandments hang the law and the prophets that's what matthew twenty two forty says so there's a like a summarization in a sense of you know of it so when he says these words what you're saying is these words basically is like the package of all the 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 commands it's like the summarization of yeah of all the commands specifically in this in the context of, of deuteronomy 6 where they're trying to relate the first and the great commandment to mm -hmm keeping or to loving the Lord your God with all your heart and mind. That's a fairly abstract, non-specific thing, but it is it is these these core ten words that he's speaking about. That uh, kind of unpacks what it means, what it looks like practically to sure. yeah. yeah. Yeah, practically way that's a practical way to love love God yep. is to not have any gods before him, not do and not have any idol worship, not to make his name uh, vain or worthless, and to honor his Sabbath. Those are four ways to do that. And then the six other commands within there are excellent ways to love your neighbor by mm -hmm. not stealing from him, not coveting from him, mm -hmm. not killing him, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so then the, this book is, then tries to relate what they call the first commandment, you know, love God with all your heart, to the Passover by claiming that God commanded us to tie symbols of the first commandment on our hand and on our forehead. So now they're they're trying to take this this um, this verse and back in Deuteronomy six, they're saying uh, where it says tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads, mm -hmm. and they're they're claiming that that the love of the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and might. So that so they're twisting the words. Uh, so maybe let me let me read this here again out of the Wumskog study. Um, so it says. So Deuteronomy 6, just kind of set the context here again. Deuteronomy 6 tells us to, uh, to um, it says these commandments, which should be these words, are to be upon your heart. It's something that we should tie on our hands, bind them on our foreheads. And then in, the, in their study, what they say is, okay, what words should we tie as symbols on our hands and bind on our foreheads? It is, love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. This means that we should tie the first commandment on our hands and bind it on our foreheads. And then they say this. However, God said the same thing about the Passover in Exodus 13. And yeah, so they're yeah, going to kind glad of you read that out loud because that, that shows the that shows the point I'm trying to get to that they're they've just butchered the whole thing mm -hmm. <laughs> that they're redefining what the first commandment is because it, it, it does not say that they should be tying the first commandment on the on the hand. 
and then they've, they've already redefined what the first commandment is to being the greatest commandment. So they're, they're mixing so up terms there's already, there. There's so many issues yeah. in that already. Yeah, like the fact that they're saying the first commandment is love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So you, what you're saying is like that, even that is problematic yeah. because that's being taken out of yeah, and, and then they're going to, you know, then they say it's supposed to be tied in your hands. And like, however, God said the same thing about Passover. So so what they're trying to do basically is saying. Yeah, they're going, it they're gets going so, to. It gets yeah. very confusing very quickly. Yeah, um, yeah they, they go to Exodus 13. And I can read that real quick. Yeah. It's 13, 8 through 9. It says, on that day, tell your son, I will. I do this because of what the Lord did for me. When I came out of Egypt, this observance will be for you like a sign on your hand and a reminder for your forehead, for the law of the Lord is to be on your lips. And so then in their, the way that they describe this afterwards, um, as they say, what does this observance indicate here? It is the Passover. Because when they came out of Egypt, what did the Lord do for the Israelites was to give them the Passover. God told his people to tie the Passover on their hand and bind it on their foreheads. In Deuteronomy 6, God told them to tie the first commandment. Not true on their hands and bind it on their foreheads. In Exodus 13, he told them to tie the Passover on their hands and bind it on their foreheads. Therefore, the first and greatest commandment is Passover. Hmm. Shockingly bad logic. Is Passover even in Exodus 13? Uh, so they're trying to assert that Exodus 13 is a reference to Passover, right? Am I getting that right? Yeah, it it, it is in a sense that he's talking about the, the memorial. Of the it. memorial, right. But it, but it, they've they've just now jumped crazy conclusion because of this the act of of putting it on your hand as a symbol of your hand and on your forehead they've tied it to the greatest commandment and now because the Passover said the same thing they're like they're equating they're saying therefore the first and greatest commandment is the Passover and then they can do so much butchering after that mm-hmm. if, if you've elevated the Passover to being the greatest commandment which they just did. Then you've you've made it something it isn't, yeah. And now you can create all sorts of weird doctrines, yeah. which yeah. they do. Which is exactly what they do. Yeah. Okay, so let me just re- read this. Did you read this part yet? I did. Yeah, I read this okay. throughout here. So the the first and greatest commandment is the Passover. So <laughs> so it's like this is this is the sleight of hand where it's yeah. like you start out with the 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 testimony of the scripture where like. You have Christ himself being asked, "What is the first and greatest commandment?" And, and he, he tells he's us, "He's asked, what's what's the greatest commandment?" Yeah, what's the, and, and they're the gonna greatest, yeah. they're gonna try to tie it yeah. in. So, so scripturally, let me let me just let's just first establish because I want to I want to say like what they do is they get from here where we have the Bible actually telling us plainly what is the greatest commandment, and they somehow they they twist and and sleight of hand and do their magic tricks basically with the Bible and they get us here where to the Passover, right? So biblically speaking, what, what is actually the first and great, what is the greatest commandment? Um, Is it the Passover? No, the greatest commandment is what Jesus told us in Matthew 22, 37. And you shall love Yahweh, your Elohim, with all your heart and with all your being, with all your mind. So the Lord, your God, with all your heart, soul, and mind. And then in 38, it says, this is the first and great commandment. He's not saying that it's the first commandment. Oh, remember back to the first of the Ten Commandments? He's not referring back to that because in the next verses, he's saying the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you were going to tie this commandment to the first of the Ten Commandments, you'd have to tie love your neighbor as yourself back to the, back to the second of the 10 commandments, yeah. which is you shall have no other idols. So good luck with that. Yeah. Um, and, and which you're not going to do because, because yep. they cut it off. <laughs> and is that, that's kind of where this, this problem starts, right? Cause you start out yeah, with started the, off. the first yeah. commandment is love Lord, your God with all your heart. They erroneously. Well, the greatest commandment is the, great, the greatest they, commandment. They, and they, they say the first, to, yes, <laughs> yes. I keep saying that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the greatest commandment, right? You start here. They jump to the false conclusion that this is a reference to the first commandment. And that's kind of where, like you, you, you point out earlier, you have this slight detour that, mm-hmm. that seems like plausible. Okay. Mm-hmm. But what that ends up doing is like once you're off track, yeah, yeah. you're just going to keep going. Yeah, you just off track a little bit. Yeah. And we start getting this far. And, like, and, oh you went, and then you end up with, oh, Passover. Passover is the greatest is the in the first, first commandment. commandment. Like, and you end, up, you end up with the claims. <laughs> that of, escalated quickly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And you end up with the claims like that you'll find from Ju Chol Kim, who says Passover is the core 
yeah. of the Bible. It's the core truth of the Bible, making these claims. And, and that's an issue. And what, what a terrible way, what an unhealthy way, what a dishonest way to interpret the Bible. Yeah. So they, they eventually go into like, uh, yeah, I think we could probably go to um, skip ahead to the core of the gospel. They, they say several things yeah. about the Passover that I don't, I don't completely disagree with about some of the importances of right. it and this kind of stuff. And so in, in all that, I actually agree to some extent. Um, but then they kind of get into the core of the gospel. Was that chapter six? Yeah. Let's see, is that chapter six? Yeah. So we're actually we're gonna go backwards yeah. in whatever book this is in. We're gonna go back to chapter six where where it's titled, What is the Gospel? This is probably gonna get to where it becomes the distinction between what is the true gospel and what is the false gospel. It's gonna be become pretty clear, I think. Towards the very end of chapter seven. They make the claim that it is only the church of God that worships only God by keeping the Passover. And so I have to do a little bit of history here and kind of point out that that's not the case. That's not the case. Okay, so. so. <laughs> uh, before the World Mission Society Church of God was ever conceived, there was the Worldwide Church of God, which many of you may have heard of, led by Herbert Armstrong. Uh, he started preaching on the radio back in the 30s. Um, it really was worldwide. He taught people to keep the feasts and the Sabbaths, and there's a little doubt in my mind that the Worldwide Church of God was influenced by his beliefs and teaching. I think that Aung San Gong was very likely, mm -hmm. uh, probably heard a lot yeah, of those he, things. Yeah, Aung San Gong probably was seeing the way he was teaching and influenced yeah, by yeah. by. Oh, him. yeah. Because I, I, there are people, part of the Hebrew Roots Movement, that came out of the Worldwide Church of God, and I've had similar arguments with them hmm. about this Passover thing. Okay. Some, of, some of them will elevate the Passover pretty high. Yep. Um, so I'm kind of familiar with the doctrine a little bit. Um, but it's, uh, so there, he came about before Aung San Gan did. And uh, so that delegitimizes their claim a mm -hmm. little bit. Uh, also, in the Dark Ages, there were the Anabaptists, the Arnolas, the Arnolas Day, the Pasagenians, the Petrobrusians, the Cathari, the Chaldee, the Waldenses, and the Albigenses. Wow. Uh, so there, these are all the different groups. These are in, all groups. In, in the Middle Ages, in the Dark Ages in Europe, just in Europe, that they Observe doing, the Passover. Now we're keeping the Sabbath, and I think the Passover as well. Okay. Uh, so, and these were different groups that opposed the Catholic Church. Okay. Uh, and then before that, in the first and second century AD, uh, at the time of the Apostles, there were the Nazarenes. Here's some early church father quotes about the Nazarenes. It says, The Nazarenes accept Messiah in such a way that they do not cease to observe the old law. That's Jerome. They believe that Messiah, the Son of God, is born of the Virgin Mary, Jerome. Uh, letter to Augustine. They disagree with the Jews because they have come to faith in Christ, but since they still fettered by the law, circumcision, the Sabbath, and the rest, they are not in accord with the Christians. That is Ephesians. Uh, of Salamis, okay. and then once again, he says they not only use the New Testament, also the Old as well as the Jews do. And this is the same group that Paul was accused of being the ringleader of in Acts 24, mm -hmm. verse 5. says, we have found this man to be a pestilence, stirring up dissension among the Jews all over the world. He's the ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Um, so this is, and there's, I guess there's one more quote uh, from Eusebius in his church history. He says, a, a question of no small importance arose at that time, at the close, in, the close of the second century, for the parishes of Asia, as from an older tradition, held that the 14th day of the moon, on which day the Jews were commanded to sacrifice the lamb, should be observed as the feast of the Savior's Passover. The bishops of Asia, led by Polycrates, decided to hold to the old custom handed down to them. He himself, in a letter which he addressed to the vicar of the Church of Rome, set forth in the following words the tradition which came down to him. We observe the exact day, neither adding nor taking away. For in Asia also great lights have fallen asleep, which shall rise on the day of the Lord's coming, when he shall come with glory in heaven, and shall seek out all his saints, not in South Korea. Uh, among these are Philip and one of the twelve apostles, and moreover John, who was both a witness and teacher who reclined at the bosom of the Lord, and Polycarp in Smyrna, who was a bishop and martyr. Those observed the fourteenth day of the Passover, according to the gospel, deviating in no respect the following the rule of faith. So I, I mentioned all this just to show that Passover 
has been around. People have been doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think actually this is something that probably we'll need to do a whole other video about because I think some of this, some of these quotes that you use, depending on the time frame, is probably things they would also use. Mm. Oh, to, to support that. That is important. Yeah, and I think actually probably some of these things are, and that, that's something, again, that I want to look into more and I know needs addressed more specifically by us um, uh, because they would, I think, emphasize the fact that, you know, you see some of these uh, dating back to the apostles, keeping the Passover. Um, they would say, see, it's something that we have to do. I think the problem would be finding evidence that they were doing it for so, salvation. Okay. I, th I think yeah. that would be the thing. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that, that that there's any any evidence that that's why they were doing it. But. Yeah, right. Th well, especially when you have like John's epistles and and yeah. the gospel where he says everything to the contrary of that. But yeah, yeah. So uh, I, that was just a little side note of history to kind of combat the claim that 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 the Church mm -hmm. of God is the only people doing it and. That's, uh, and I've never I never heard of Aung San Gong, and I've been keeping Passover since 2012. Yeah. So. And so, I, obviously, like they responded to you, they'd say, "Well, do you keep it on the right day? Do you, you know?" And they'll try to they'll try to again twist it to where <laughs> they'll probably be taken aback a little bit. You know, when when even even people watching this might be like, "Oh, that that dude's keeping the Passover." Like I I thought we were the only ones doing that. I think if you go and you ask, you know, the 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 pastors. In the Wumskog, if you if you go back and ask, well, what's what's up with this? They're keeping the Passover. They'll they'll probably twist it and try to combat that by saying, well, he's not doing it, he's not doing it correctly. Or they'll say, well, you have to keep all the commandments of God in order for that to take effect. And so they'll they'll weasel their way out of all it. But I think the reason we emphasize this is just to show that this group puts so much emphasis on the fact that they keep Passover. They make it seem as if they're the only ones, they're the only church doing this, they're the only ones keeping this, this command of Jesus. And so that makes them unique and yeah. that must mean they're the true church. Yeah. That's just not And that's what I want to dispel. Yeah. I, want the, I want that notion to yeah. fall apart in their heads. Yeah. Uh, There's many, many groups doing it and you can, you can try to say they're doing it incorrectly, but that's, that's yeah. just kind of a weak argument to me. So yeah. <laughs> anyways. Yeah. And we can go on to the the next chapter. Let's just, yeah, so let's, what we're going to do, we're going to jump to chapter six, and we'll, let's try to get through this yeah, quickly, we and we'll try to wrap this up um, and kind of show, kind of, this, I think, kind of summarizes the emphasis they put on the Passover and how their convoluted ways of interpreting Scripture, they, they derail a little bit, and it ends up in this horrible, horrible place where Passover is exalted, to a, basically Passover becomes exalted over the person of Jesus, which um, I would assert um, at the core, if you look at what makes, uh, I'll just, I'll say this, a religious cult, a cult um, is what they do with Jesus. Um, what, and, and I say like a Christian, a Christian cult, a cult that's diverted from Christian truth at the core of it, it's always centered around the revelation of who Jesus is. And basically a cult comes forth out of a lack of revelation, a lack of knowledge of who he is, a lack of, like Paul says in Ephesians, like holding, he talks about those who, Ephesians and Colossians, who don't, they don't hold fast to the head, which is Christ. Basically they become cut off from the head from sourcing all knowledge and wisdom from the person of Jesus. And they begin sourcing uh, and uh, bringing out doctrine and theology from a different source rather than Christ as the head, which is basically a good analogy of that is like a chicken without a head just running around and it just is going to accomplish nothing. It's going to yeah. be a, a, a mess. Um, and so I think, I think that's, that's what happens here. When you see Passover exalted over Jesus, that's a, to say that's a red flag is not enough. It's yeah. like, that's not enough. It's like, yeah. that's like, just throw that thing out and run as fast as you can. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in this chapter, they have a subsection titled, so the chapter is called, what is the gospel? And the subsection is called the core of the gospel is Passover. Um, and they start off the section by saying to explain the covenant simply, it is the Passover. So they're, hmm. they're, they're equating terms now. They're like covenant is Passover. Uh, and they're going to do terrible things with that that kind of false equation. Mm -hmm. 
And they say, at that time, what covenant did Jesus establish through Passover? Jesus established the new covenant. Therefore, the Passover is the core of the gospel. So that, well, they, they quote from... Um, uh, they quote from Luke twenty two twenty. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And so then they say he instituted the new covenant. Um, therefore, the Passover is the core of the gospel in the new covenant, which is just. Uh, it's one of those things where the argumentation is almost so bad. Like I, I found myself in this place where it's like, I don't. I almost don't even know where to start. It's just like, if, if you're convinced by that reasoning, it's like, I don't, it's almost, it's the argumentation is so bad. The logic is so bad. The reasoning is so bad that it's almost, I find myself sometimes in places like, what do you even, what do you even say? Yeah. Like, like if they're convinced by that, like there's, I, and, I, I, there's nothing even to say. It's yeah. like, you can't, you can't reason with this kind of. And they're, uh, they're going to, they're going to do some some violence with that that equate that false equation. Yep. They go to Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, one seven through nine, uh, to where it says, "And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and for the from the glory of his power." So if you take the false equation that they just did, you know, that, you know, that obeyed not the gospel of Jesus Christ, they're going to get vengeance taken out of fire, destruction. Mm-hmm. And they're going to say that they're, they're basically going to make the claim that if you don't keep Passover. I mean, yeah. that the they covenant don't. is Passover. So if you don't keep Passover, flaming destruction. The yeah. they're, they're basically, in essence, they're equating the the Passover equals the gospel. Yeah. If you said, what is the gospel? What is the good news of salvation? Well, it's the, it's the Passover. It's that God gave us this ordinance to keep where we drink yeah. wine and eat bread. And through that, he He repays us yeah. with forgiveness yeah, of sins. With, yeah, protection from the plague. And protection right that. from the coronavirus, which yeah. is a big thing a lot of members right now are posting about on Facebook that they're protected from the coronavirus. And I, I, I said this in a comment, and I can't remember where it was, probably Instagram or something. I don't wish or hope for the coronavirus to affect members. Like, that's not my wish. But it will be interesting to see, yeah. and I think telling to yeah. see, what, what 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 does it mean when members do? My, yeah, my, my fear, I was thinking about this too, is like, I just fear that people, that immediately if, if a member were to get it, they would... They would immediately claim that this is not a real believer. He's not a real member, believer. Yeah. He, he, he didn't keep he Passover didn't, yeah. correctly. Right. I mean, they're just, and they're going to, it's, and that pains my heart because that's yeah. not how we ought to be it is. towards people. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, so they've equated the gospel with Passover and they've used Second Thessalonians. This, now they're trying to, this is, this is part of where you'll see the fear tactic. This is a huge tactic they use to keep members within the doors. They'll get them in and they shut the doors behind members with these. These terror. This is a somewhat terrifying scripture. You know, yeah. you don't obey the gospel, you're going to suffer punishment and everlasting destruction, shut out from the presence of the Lord. But what they're doing is, is through their convoluted teaching, they've put Passover, they've inserted Passover into this verse, eisegesis, rather than looking at this scripture and unpacking it and saying, "Oh, look, Paul was talking about Passover," which he wasn't. Passover was not in his mind here yeah. at all. It couldn't be farther from that. He's talking about the gospel, which is not Passover, and um, but but yeah, this is this is this is a, a, a really good example of how they will yeah. that you see the fear tactic being instilled, where they set up Passover as this core thing of the gospel, and then they say, and if you don't keep it, wrath, vengeance, fire, you know, and, and so and now now you got people not only having had this this twisted. Uh, study of scripture to point to Passover being the core of the gospel. But now you have this, this, um, this aspect of fear being played into it where, where you're kind of being pushed. It's, it's almost like pushing them to further encourage them to believe the things they've already said about Passover, because it's like, well, if I don't, then it's hell. And so yeah. it just kind of turns into this dishonest, yeah. mess um, of interpreting scripture. Yeah. And I think we'll, we can do that now or later, but we can redefine what that gospel message is. And I guess as a, as a statement that I would say now is that 
Passover isn't the core of the gospel that this is trying to explain. It's more like the kickoff party. It's it's the it's what was going on when when Jesus was instituting the new covenant. And so there's somewhat special in that in that kind of sense. Um, so each year we we observe it. it we, each year we observe the Passover. It's a memorial of the institution. But the gospel, when it is preached, is not focused on the idea of drinking wine, eating bread, saying a few words. Uh, you know, it's it's focused on the freedom from sin, the freedom from 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 uh, addictions, uh, mm-hmm. freedom from selfishness, freedom from demon possession, freedom, freedom from condemnation, from from, 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 from deception, from, from yeah. Brainwashing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah. all sorts of stuff. It's the greater exodus. It's the good news that the kingdom of heaven is here. It is near. It's not all the way here quite yet in a sense, but that is, that's the big picture of, you know, we get to, we get to live again. We mm-hmm. get to live in the here and now we get to live again. We mm-hmm. get to have a new life. And also in the future, we get to have, we get, when we die, we raise again. So that. That would I would say would be the core, you know, something along those lines, the core of the gospel. So it's it's actually more it's like an emphasis. It's almost you could say like a direct the direct opposite of what they say it's about. <laughs> it's like where Passover their their ideas of Passover and what the gospel is really it results in this lifestyle of fear. It's like if you sign up for this, what they're saying, you're signing up for a life of fear. Oh, where yeah. it's if I don't do my part, yeah. I'm going to get blasted. Yeah. Well, rather than that being what the point of Passover is, Passover is actually saying, no, Jesus has already been blasted for, for us yeah. so that we can now have peace. And, and Passover is a way of, well, what did Jesus say? Do this in remembrance of me. We remember Jesus' broken body for us. We remember his blood shed on the cross. We And we partake in that as an act of, of worship for something that God has already done, not as an act of earning something that we want God to do for us in the future. Um, yeah. The gospel, the true gospel says done. False gospels always, every time a false gospel is going to say do. Hmm. True gospel says done. Jesus has done it. Uh, you look at Colossians, the whole book of Colossians is so emphasizes the supremacy of Christ and the finality of what Jesus has done for us and the completeness of what we have in that. A false gospel is going to is going to always twist what Jesus has done to make it seem as if he left something unfinished that we must do to kind of finish out that work or basically like Jesus did his part and now we do our part. That was kind of as far as for the the book study that's that's kind of my concluding remarks on on just the directions that they go on that, but just to kind of summarize it back and try to redefine mm-hmm. the gospel there at the end. Yep. Um, yeah. Great. Well, I think what what we're going to do is we'll do a second video here that'll come out soon uh, where we will kind of probably touch on the Passover, but we what we really want to focus on is what is the gospel? What is the gospel? What makes the gospel good news? What it, at its essence, what is it? What, what, uh, what defines a person that is saved versus a person that is unsaved and what are the requirements of salvation? And so I think as we focus on that, and, and, and again, we want to make this video where we're focusing more on what the gospel is rather than focusing on what in this video has kind of been about what Passover is not. Because I think when you focus on and you, you clearly define what the Bible says the gospel is, and you clearly define what the Bible says G- who Jesus is, well, then you can really just from that, you can go and, and you can analyze the teachings of the world and society. And, and you can, when you know who Jesus is, that's already established. You can see who he's not. Mm-hmm. And you can see like, man, they're saying this this stuff and it might seem convincing. And they might have these scriptures that seem as if they're backing it up. But I already know it's already been established who Jesus is. And this contradicts it. I already know what the gospel is. And this does not go in line with that. And so I think, yeah, we hope to put that out soon and um, hope, yeah, continue to just hope these videos are helpful to you guys. And um, if you have questions, if you have comments, please send those our way. And and we hope to either answer those in the comments or uh, even in future videos, if it's, if it's questions that um, are big enough to warrant uh, doing that. Yeah. I'll, I'll go. And once this video is posted, I'll, I'll, I'll continually get on there to check comments and stuff and try to respond to questions, concerns, and, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Awesome. My, my YouTube uh, name is tempting no one. Uh, so I'll, I'll be looking out for your questions and stuff.
Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on today, Tim. Yeah, it's been a blessing. Hopefully it's been edifying to the audience. Yes. 